I'm Carol Weston and I thank you for joining us. I'm going to introduce you today to a man who has dedicated himself to increasing broadband access in rural areas like Maine. And if there's one thing that's changed our lives, it certainly is the internet. Congressman Rick Boucher worked dil diligently for 28 years in the House of Representatives for the 9th District of Virginia. Currently, he is the honorary chair of the Internet Innovation Alliance. The Internet, Internet Innovation Alliance is a broad-based coalition. And my first question is, what does this coalition want to do and why are you a participant? Well, for 28 years, uh, as you indicated, Carol, I was a uh, member of the U.S. Congress representing a, a very rural district in Virginia. Uh, it is the most rural district uh, in the state of Virginia, 27 counties spanning two mountain ranges and actually closer to seven other state capitals than to Richmond. So it was remote, it was rural, it's an uh, Appalachian country, and so uh, improving the economy was always a challenge. And, everyone's highest priority. And we found over the time that I served in Congress that one of the best ways to do that was to connect our region to the economic mainstream by deploying broadband backbones and then encouraging local service providers to offer what we call a last mile service. That would be the service from a central point within the community tied to a backbone into the residences of individuals and into the premises of businesses. And as broadband expanded, we saw a real transformation in our economy. It had been based on traditional manufacturing, a pretty low wage in fact, garment factories and furniture factories. And as those left and went to even lower wage places like China and Mexico, uh, and as some of our extraction industries also began to decline, uh, timber production left when the furniture manufacturing left, and then uh, the coal industry over the years, which was the other major extractive industry, also was in decline for a variety of different reasons. And so we really needed a new kind of economy, and broadband brought that to us. Today we have 10,000 jobs, and they're in things like customer service centers and technical support centers placed in the region by national companies in order to serve their national customer base. But they came to our region because the costs were low, uh, the workers were plentiful and dedicated and loyal, and we had broadband. And that enabled them to locate there, take advantage of those assets, and serve their national customers very efficiently. Now we have an even higher level of, of wage, about 70 to 80,000 a year, uh, in more than 700 jobs that are involved in software engineering and database management, um, investments that virtually any community across the country would very much like to have. And those also came to our area for the very same reasons that the call centers did, because we had the broadband architecture to accommodate their needs, and uh, we had uh, plentiful workers and low cost of doing business. So I've seen what it can do. Uh, in a rural area. Broadband was the bridge that tied us to the American economy and helped to make our region much more prosperous and, and economically successful. And I want to see the same thing happen for the entire nation. So I'm, I'm now pleased to be the honorary chair of the Internet Innovation Alliance. And we're a nonprofit organization. We have 175 members, all collected around a central purpose. And that purpose is to obtain nationwide broadband deployment and to do so within about the next five to six years. And we think that goal is now well within our reach. And today I'm glad to have an opportunity to talk to you about a couple of very achievable steps we think our country can take in order to get to that goal. Well, you bring up some really good points. And I think everyone agrees that there are areas that are underserved. Um, I have small businesses in my area who uh, are still doing dial-up and trying to operate a business. Um, knowing that, then how can IIA and the goals that you've set forward, how can you bring this to fruition and expand this to, uh, to everyone who wants? Well, first let me comment on the very important point that, that you just made, that uh, businesses really do need broadband today. 
I think it's the modern essential infrastructure. It's as important to business success today as having a telephone yes. or having electricity service shortly after those utilities were introduced about a century ago. Uh, it wasn't long until communities without phone service or electricity service began to lag behind. And that led to a number of uh, programs that were targeted just to get those facilities where they needed to be. You had uh, rural electric co-ops, yeah. you had rural telephone co-ops that filled the gap where the private sector could not afford to make an economic investment due to big distances and small populations. Uh, you had the Tennessee Valley Authority form back in the Depression years to deliver electricity into the Tennessee Valley and that area in the lower Mississippi where uh, electricity service had not come because of private investment. And today we're in exactly the same situation with regard to broadband. It is the new essential infrastructure. And communities that either don't have it or don't have a sufficiently high speed for the broadband service to meet business needs find themselves lagging behind. That is why I think it's so important to obtain nationwide broadband deployment. And the parts of the country that will benefit the most when that happens will be rural America. Because rural America today is where we have broadband have-nots. It is the place where the gaps exist. And it is the place where nationwide deployment of broadband will make the biggest difference in improving the economy and facilitating things like telemedicine and distance learning that brings a whole new quality of life to rural residents. So the point you've made is very valid. Now the question you ask, I, I'm, I'm very happy to answer. How do we get there? There are three simple steps that the Internet Innovation Alliance is promoting in order to help us achieve nationwide broadband coverage. And we think we can achieve that during the first half of, of the next 10-year period. Three things to do. First of all, the Federal Communications Commission should reform the Universal Service Fund. That's about a $7 billion annual fund. In order to enable that fund to be expended, at least in part, to provide broadband services. That fund was set up a long time ago in order to make sure that America had the same low-cost telephone service in rural areas that it has in the urban areas. But rural areas are high cost to serve. The populations tend to be small, the distances are great, it simply costs more to provide a telephone line in an area like that than it does uh, in a tightly populated urban center. Uh, but today, telephone rates in rural areas and in urban areas are essentially the same. And that's because of this universal service fund that every year supports the provision of phone service at affordable rates in, low co in high cost areas. It is restricted today just to telephone service. It can't be spent for broadband. We think the time has come to change that fund and to allow some of those monies to be expended for broadband and then over time transition that fund so that within a five to eight year period it's expended entirely for broadband. Now the Federal Communications Commission has a proceeding pending that would achieve that result and we hope they get it done this year. It's not entirely clear they will do it this year. So our first objective is to encourage people who agree that we should mm -hmm. enable the carriers that today are offering phone service to get support when they offer broadband service and make it feasible for them to do it in places where they haven't. Uh, should write a letter to the FCC saying, please do this and do it as, as quickly as possible. Reform the Universal Service Fund and, and make that possible. We have a second step that is also very achievable and will make a big difference. Today in the cities, uh, some of the telephone networks, so the cellular networks that carry wireless services and support smartphones are becoming stressed. And so you have things like dropped calls and slow connections. We've all experienced that from time to time. The reason that's happened is because the amount of smartphone use has exceeded all of the early expectations. And the very strong cellular networks that existed 10 years ago have now become stressed. And in some places, the phenomenon known as spectrum exhaust is beginning to be experienced where the networks are so utilized that there simply is not enough capacity 
to accommodate additional cell phone use. And we know the growth is accelerating dramatically in smartphone use, and, and that trend will continue. To enable it to continue, with all the benefits that smartphones bring, we need to make more spectrum available. And the Congress should pass a law that gives the Federal Communications Commission the authority to set up something we call incentive auctions. And through these incentives, once the FCC puts this process in place, a television broadcaster in a city that may be uh, an independent station, not affiliated with one of the networks, and maybe that independent station is showing old movies. Now, it's got a small viewership, but it has a very rich spectrum. And that television broadcaster might find it financially attractive to donate a part or all of its spectrum uh, so that that spectrum can be auctioned to the wireless carriers. And then the broadcaster would receive an incentive for that contribution, and that incentive would be a part of the auction revenues on a formula to be negotiated between the broadcaster and the FCC as part of the agreement to, to make that spectrum contribution. Uh, this will work. A number of the independent stations in the large cities have said they will take advantage of, of this opportunity if it arises. And in the large cities is exactly the place where we have the spectrum exhaust problem. So it's kind of a magic bullet that strikes right at the heart of the spectrum need. Uh, Congress is considering this. We're hoping that the super committee that is currently considering recommendations to reduce the deficit will include this item as a part of its package of recommendations. It does produce some revenue for the government so it can help to reduce the deficit. It uh, allows television broadcasters to optimize their opportunities if they'd rather not be broadcasting but rather receive uh, the money for their spectrum. And it puts new spectrum in the hands of the cellular companies that are uh, supporting smartphone services. So that's, that's our priority number two. Writing to the Congress and encouraging the Congress to take that step and to do it this fall would be uh, very helpful to us. The third step that we support is for the federal government to approve the pending merger between AT&T and T-Mobile. AT&T has made the pledge that within six years of that merger being completed, it will expand broadband coverage to 97% of the American population. I think it's instructive that President Obama has set a national goal of 98% of all Americans having broadband coverage within a five-year period. So one company alone, AT&T, spending private capital, not taxpayer money, will come within 1% of the president's goal and within one year of his time frame. Now, that would leave a much smaller gap to be filled by uh, the broadband funds from the Universal Service Fund when that's reformed, by other private investment, and by grants and loans from the Rural Utility Service and mm -hmm. other funding sources. And the combination of those, all, of those things together can result in the president's goal of 98% of coverage within a five-year period being met. Three simple steps. Uh, individuals who agree that we should take those steps can contact their members of Congress, can write to the Federal Communications Commission, which would need to approve this merger, and also can write to the Department of Justice and encourage the Department of Justice to negotiate an acceptable settlement to the lawsuit that the department has filed uh, with the goal of blocking the merger. Uh, the department said in its filing that it was concerned about the effect of the merger on competition. And I, I just want to address that for yes. a moment because it is something that uh, is in the public debate and I think it deserves an answer. History shows us that every time there's a combination in the wireless space, and we've had a number of mergers over time. SBC bought Singular and merged the Bell South and, and the SBC cellular operations. Verizon bought Altel, uh, a major consolidation within the wireless space. And every time these combinations have happened, the result is that consumer prices have gone down. They have not gone up. And I'm confident that would happen again after this merger is completed because innovation is unparalleled in, in, in the cellular space. And new smartphones are coming on the market all the time that are much more capable and actually cheaper than the previous generation. 
And I think we're going to see that trend continue. That has a downward effect on prices. The other reality is that after this merger is completed, in 18 of the 20 largest cities across the country, there will still be five or more providers of wireless service from which to choose. And so there will be adequate competition to assure good pricing in the market and a high level of service. And the prices as set in these very competitive urban centers carry across to the whole country because pricing for smartphone and cellular services are nationwide in character. They really have to be given the mobile nature of the industry. Otherwise, if you live in a rural area with a high price, you could sign up in a city with a low price and just use your cell phone from anywhere, including at home in the rural area. In recognition of that fact, all of these plans have national pricing. It costs the same in the smallest town as in the largest city. So the price would be set in the urban environment, mm -hmm. which is highly competitive and then carried across to the entire country. Given that reality, yes, you are taking one provider of cellular service out of the mix, but in the big cities, you have five or more providers of that service remaining in order to assure a competitive price. Let me give you a disclaimer. I need to do this. Um, we have 175 members in our alliance. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to universal broadband deployment. AT&T is one of our members but we do not form our agenda based upon the individual agendas <clears throat> of any of our member companies. So while they're a member, this is a principle that all 175 of our members endorse, and we endorse it for the reason that we think it's in the public interest, because it is the single step that will lead the fastest to universal broadband deployment. And when that uh, deployment occurs, it's going to be with the newest generation of wireless technology the fourth generation of LTE technology that carries data at about 20 megabits per second. Now, to put that in practical terms, it's as fast as your cable modem service it's at home, it's as fast as your DSL service at home, and it becomes a competitor to cable and to DSL. So if you live in a place where you've only got a phone company offering DSL and no cable, or a cable company offering cable modem service and no DSL and prices are high, here's a competitor coming into the market that's going to give you an alternative. You can sign up with the alternative and just have a wireless experience, even tying your desktop to that wireless service. Or uh, it'll probably drive the price of the existing cable or DSL service down, uh, benefiting you in that community. So when you look at co competition across the board, Yes, you've got one wireless carrier being removed and consolidated with AT&T, but you've got another strong competitor in the broadband space. And that's going to produce great benefits, even for people who have broadband service today. I can't imagine a single thing we can do that would help the economy or quality of life more uh, that is achievable in the near term than taking this step. Well, this is very, very helpful, and I want to bring it down to um, Maine once again and show uh, the audience a clip um, of a Machias police officer talking about how that expanded broadband would work in rural Maine and help him in this local police department. Let's watch. Well, help me on calls. Uh, modern policing has switched drastically from radio communications into cell phone and internet communications. And in the area I currently work, uh, internet and cell service is spotty at best. I'll lose service in the middle of the town I work in. Um, and we drastically need improvement so that we're able to better communicate and better uh, complete the cases we currently have and complete them as fast as possible for the citizens of the municipality I work for. What do you think when you hear something like that from a Mainer? First of all, I'm proud to see somebody named Boucher doing so well on television, <laughs> but he pronounces it Boucher. I, I pronounce it Boucher. There are not that many of us across the country. And, no, I was going to ask you, know, you if you were related. <laughs> uh, we, well, we, you know, we probably are. Uh, I, I, I hope to have the opportunity someday to explore that possibility with Michael, and, and he's exactly right in everything that he says. Uh, broadband really does help first responders. It's a terrific way for them to be able to have interactive communications and have communications that 
uh, are also interdepartmental, so they can have communications across all of their first responder disciplines. Fire can talk to rescue, can talk yes. to police, and broadband makes that possible. The new 4G technology will be a great aid in, in oh. that effort. Um, I am going to go back to uh, another Mainer, and this time I have to say um, this uh, person that we're going to listen to is a state representative, Tyler Clark, and I can't introduce this segment without mentioning that Tyler grew up in this little town of Easton, which um, I went to school with his dad, so um, we know each other well. Let's listen to Tyler. Businesses are looking for high-speed internet, and if you can't, if there's an area that you can't get high-speed internet, you're not going to find any new businesses moving in. A lot of higher tech, newer businesses couldn't go anywhere if there's enough services, uh, such as low energy, uh, good cell, cell phone service, good internet. But if, you, if one of those components is missing, uh, you're not going to be able to attract people compared to cities. Oh, certainly. It's a, it's a, in today's world, you, you need as much access as possible. What we must do is oftentimes the, the technology or the desire for the technology is lags behind because of one integral part of the equation. Bandwidth is the integral part of this equation. Bandwidth for Maine is a critical part of this equation. Bandwidth in rural areas in Maine is very deficient. This is why the the basic basically to have the Internet Innovation Alliance working toward this end is, is what we're praying for. We're praying for more access. Congressman, can you tell us what you see in the future with telemedicine and what that would mean to have that broadband access to, to further that? Well, I'm so happy to hear the doctor comment about his experience here in Maine because it's very similar to the experience we had in the western part of Virginia. We were able about five or six years ago to deploy telemedicine facilities to, uh, to all of our local clinics and hospitals uh, throughout the congressional district. We've got about 60 of those connected now with telemedicine links to the University of Virginia's hospital in Charlottesville. Charlottesville is more than 200 miles away from uh, my previous very rural congressional district. And it used to be that if people needed a, an expert opinion, they would have to make that long trip. Yeah. Uh, it's very expensive. It takes several days. Oftentimes, people simply could not afford to either take the time or, or, or incur the expense of that trip, and so they would sometimes go without that expert diagnosis. Now, instead of doing that, they can simply go right around the corner to a local clinic and connect to that physician, that specialist at the hospital in Charlottesville through telemedicine, and get that same expert diagnosis uh, with the same degree of accuracy as if they'd actually taken the trip and sat in that uh, doctor's emergency room. They have a teleconference with the doctor. They uh, can, uh, all their data can be sent over a high-speed data link, and the doctor sees and hears the patient and can uh, look at all the data and render an expert diagnosis. And so it really has worked a revolution in the quality of rural health care. It's made a huge difference. And, and I'm talking to the people at the University of Virginia who do this now, and they say that the number of consults has just soared. And they're now doing about 1,000 a month using the telemedicine length just for my old congressional district. So it, it, the, what the doctor says is absolutely right about what it does for health care delivery in, in our rural areas. Well, it certainly seems that broadband access has the ability to transform all lives, including Mainers. I want to thank you, Cong Congressman Rick Voucher, for joining us, and thank you for, as a viewer for joining us this afternoon.
can help by calling Maine's Congressional Delegation and sharing your support for expanding broadband coverage. Thank you.